Okay, so good day to everybody at UCLA and beyond. Um, and welcome to the Center for European and Russian Studies at UCLA, the virtual version. I'm thrilled to be hosting today a panel discussion of the recent book by Maite Zubiaure, Talking Trash, Cultural Uses of Waste, uh, published in 2019. Before I start, I just want to make a few logistical comments about today's Zoom uh, procedures. This is a webinar format, as you'll see. We're video recording the meeting and broadcasting on Facebook as well. After the presentation, we'll have some time for questions. So please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to write your questions, and I will then relay them to the speakers, and hopefully we'll have time for most of them. The meeting will close at 3.15. I also want to welcome you to join our Facebook site, to consult our Facebook site on um, uh, for the Center for European and Russian Studies. We have really exciting posts um, and to join our mailing list if you're not on it. Okay, so let's begin. I'm especially glad to welcome Professor Zubiaure as she is a valued member of our faculty here and also of our very own advisory committee, faculty advisory committee here at the center and such a dynamic and creative thinker, writer and artist. I'm going to um, have to mercilessly truncate what would otherwise be an extremely long introduction for all of our speakers, as they are three extraordinarily accomplished scholars. So uh, with forgiveness for my brevity, um, let me introduce first Maita herself, Professor Zubiaure, has a PhD in comparative literature from Columbia University. She's a literary translator of 19th and 20th century novels in German and Spanish, and professor jointly in the Department of Germanic Languages and the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. She has taught at UT in Austin, UNAM in Mexico, ETAM in Mexico, and at USC. She is co-PI and core faculty of the Mellon Urban Humanities Initiative, a long-standing member of the faculty advisory committee also in digital humanities, the chair of the Honors Collegium Faculty Advisory Board. She is also co-PI of the recently awarded Sawyer Seminar on Sanctuary Spaces, Reworlding Humanism. She's the author of numerous publications, among them uh, a book on the dialectics of space and gender, in uh, 19th century European and Latin American realist fiction, a book on the cultures of the erotic in, the, er, in early uh, 20th century Spain, a digital archive on early 20th century sexuality in Spain and Europe, a co-authored book on urban humanities and new practices of reimagining the city. She's presently working on a co-authored monograph on cultural representations of migrant death at the US-Mexico border and co-directing a research team working on a digital thick map of the US-Mexico borderlands. Mm. She's also a virtual uh, visual artist and collagist. And under the name of Philomena Cruz, she has initiated a number of artistic interventions, among them her longstanding Venice, California installation, The Wall That Gives El Muro Que Da. Alison Karuf is Associate Professor in the Department of English and Institute of the Environment and Sustainability at UCLA, where she currently holds the Waldo W. Nykirk Chair for Distinguished Undergraduate Teaching, and she chairs the Food Studies minor. She's an affiliate of the UCLA Institute for Society and Genetics. Since 2015, she has been the founding director of the Laboratory for Environmental Narrative Strategies. She is the recipient of multiple grants and author of many books and articles, including Global Appetites, American Power, and Liter the Literature of Food, Cambridge 2013. She is also co-author with Amy L. Tigner of Literature and Food Studies, Routledge 2018. She's a co-founder of the multimedia public environment project, Play the LA River, and is involved in ongoing collaborations with artists, scientists, and media makers. Uh, so she is also a perfect interlocutor for Maita today. Finally, uh, Charlene Villasenor Black is professor of Ibero-American art and Chicano Chicana studies 
Her research focuses on the art of the Ibero-American world. She is the winner of the 2016 Gold Shield Faculty Prize and author of the prize-winning and widely reviewed 2006 book, uh, Creating the Cult of St. Joseph, Art and Gender in the Spanish Empire. She's currently finishing her second monograph, Transforming Saints, Women, Art and Conversion in Mexico and Spain, 1521 to 1800. She's also the co-editor, the editor of the book, Chicano Art, Tradition and Transformation, and co-editor of a special edition of the Journal of Interdisciplinary History entitled Trade Networks and Materiality, Art in the Age of Global Encounters, 1492 to 1800 with uh, Dr. Maita Alvarez of the J. Paul Getty Museum. She has held grants from the Getty, from the ACLS, Fulbright, Mellon, Woodrow Wilson Foundation, and the NEH. And while much of her research investigates the politics of religious art and global exchange, Villa Senor Black is also actively engaged in the Chicana, Chicano art scene, and as such, also very much uh, a wonderful uh, interlocutor for our book today. So with that, let me uh, turn first to uh, Professor Villa Senor Black for uh, her commentary on uh, our book talk for today. Thank you. Charlene, to you. Yes, I'm, give me one second. Sure. <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the invitation to be here today um, from the Center of European and Russian Studies at UCLA. It's an honor to be able to weigh in on Professor Maite Subiarre's latest book, Talking Trash, Cultural Uses of Waste. Uh, just published in 2019, and I also wanted to mention that it just won this amazing award, uh, 2020, um, for Best Book in the Area of Art or Medicine, the Norman L. and Rosalia J. Goldberg Prize. So I'm a professor of art history and Chicano and Chicano studies here at UCLA. I'm kind of a border-crossing art historian, and it's my experience in these two fields of art history and Chicano studies that inform uh, my thoughts today. So there I am, crossing borders. Uh, and I'm thrilled to be talking about this innovative, provocative, important book on the theme of trash. And um, I love the way that Professor Zubiarre uses her academic kaleidoscope, shall we say, to look at trash and to refract all the important topics bound up in that subject. So the environment, feminism, gender studies, racism, poverty, the border, capitalism, and neoliberalism. And I appreciate the way um, this book sheds new light on the contemporary moment, but also looks back at the history of trash. Um, it's inspired by, or I saw it as inspired by the spatial turn, the interest in and theorization of the environment in academia and in the world, but especially the material turn in the humanities. And for me as an art historian, I found that very exciting. Um, for example, Professor Zubiarre demonstrates how trash or waste is an important theme or thread in contemporary artistic uh, production. So uh, I was then also introduced to artists I didn't know about, um, in, in particular this Spanish artist Francisco de Pajaro, and her work also helped me rethink artists that I've known about in, in new ways. So I was thinking of her uh, discussions of Teresa Margoyas, uh, and other artists in Mexico City. And her work reminded me of the importance of this thread of trash, reuse, recycling among many contemporary Latin American and Latinx artists. And uh, her book really provided a larger context for this important movement for me. So clearly it's a subject of global importance, but I was left wondering if the theme has a particular resonance or what is the particular resonance of the theme in the Americas? So I was thinking of works like this, Abraham Cruz Viegas, um, these constructions made out of um, trash and refuse that com uh, comment on homelessness, or Carmen Argote, this recent work that's the carpet from the apartment that she grew up in, or even uh, Doris Salcedo, a Colombian artist. 
of course, this Gabriel Orozco, the yielding stone that was rolled through the streets of Mexico City and picked up all of this detritus along the way. Or this very recent work by Carolina Caicedo in, that was shown in the Hammer Museum uh, that talks about water and talks about the environment. And then as a scholar of Chicano Chicano studies, uh, Professor Zubiarre's book also caused me to meditate on rascuache or rascuachismo, um, the term theorized by Tomas Ibarra Frausto, a term that has come to designate an underdog style in Chicano Chicano culture. Uh, supposedly, the term has Nahuatl origins. It originally certainly had negative connotations in Mexico, coding for the poor taste or the tackiness of lower class origins. And the term was brought to the US with Mexican migration. Eventually though, it was valorized um, in the Chicano or Mexican American community as a kind of underdog code to use the words of Ibarra Frausto. So it's a reference to vernacular uh, style. And one of its major strategies is to recycle or upcycle trash leftovers to create something new, elaborate, vibrant, intense and colorful. It's a kind of neo-baroque, more is more um, aesthetic. And I'm showing you just some examples. Notice the glass bottles reused in the shrine to the Virgin of Guadalupe. And here's another uh, example. This is here, right here in East LA at the Mercado. Um, it often reuses, recycles what might become trash and it manifests a sense of making do. Uh, so old car tires become decorative planters in your yard or old plastic bottles or coffee cans become uh, garden ornaments or flower pots. Um, it's an aesthetic of accumulation, uh, as you can see in these yard shrines or, or in home altars, discarded bottle caps can become earrings. And it's different, I mean, this is a discussion for later, it's different from camp or kitsch, I just wanna point that out. So it's an important thread in Chicano culture, uh, going back, I would say, in literature to the 1920s, in theater, especially El Teatro Campesino, in film, in music, corridos, and in cars, such as this low rider, and in Chicano art. So in the 60s, during the Chicano Civil Rights Movement, during the Chicano Movement, Rascuache was revalorized, um, brought to the fore. It was important because it made visible daily life struggles uh, of Mexican American peoples. And it made visible the ways in which we didn't fit into standard US molds. Um, and it valorized this idea of making do, doing your best. It's a view from the bottom, los de abajo. So, Examples of Rascuache, the performance artist Guillermo Gomez Pena in his role as Border Brujo, um, those wonderful bottle cap earrings by Goldie Garcia, who's from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I, oh, I should have worn those uh, today. Um, <laughs> for example, this uh, early Chicano artist, Ruben Trejo, Bertha de Jalapeno, David Avalos really works in this Rascuache uh, mode. Here's his uh, altar or this hub, Hubcap Milagro, which is uh, from a series, or even the conceptual performance art group, OSCO, and here's a photograph of one of their performances. Uh, you can see them there um, or here. Artist Linda Vallejo, early work that she did, or her more current work, Make Them All Mexican, this is her most recent series, in which she goes to flea markets and repurposes these little trinkets and makes them all, makes them all uh, Mexican. And then uh, this artist also, Ramiro Gomez, uh, here from okay. LA, great contemporary example, who creates these cardboard cutouts of Latino workers in LA making Latino labor uh, visible. So I wondered about how these Chicanex or Latin American artists, how their works fit into this larger picture of the cultural uses of trash. And I was also reminded of the long history of trash or recycling in Mexican art. Um, and I'm teaching colonial art right now. And I just published this article on what are called enconchados. These are hybrid artworks, mostly from the 18th century that employ shell mosaic. And you can see the little pieces of shell fit into this oil painting on panel. Um, and in this recent article, I documented the source of the shell. Uh, these are created using shells left over from the pearl industry. Um, these were fished off of the coast of Baja California. And then instead of throwing all these shells away once the pearls were extracted, artists bought the shell, polished it, and made these amazing um, artworks. 
And one of my undergrads pointed out to me this quarter that this was rasquache. This is a kind of form of colonial rasquache. <laughs> and then um, I was also curious about the history of trash in the colonial period, but also in the pre-Columbian era before Europeans arrived in the Americas and thought of this goddess, La Soteoto, who's a goddess of filth, of trash, a filth eater. And I was thinking a lot about this longer history of ritualizing trash, excess, the abject, the unwanted. But something else about this book also really piqued my interest. And that is the author's alter ego as the artist Filomena Cruz um, and her really wide, wide artistic production. And it made me think deeply about artists who write, writers who are artists. Um, I was really surprised. I knew some of her work, but surprised by the incredible range of her artistic production. And I knew these sort of whimsical paintings and collages. Um, I'd seen stories about and heard about the wall installation near her home in Venice. The photographs, however, were new to me and a complete revelation. And I'm so interested in their very clean aesthetic and the way they focus in on details and the importance of seriality here too. So I wanna just close with a few questions about the artworks. Um, what are your sources of inspiration? Um, how did you choose your alter ego's name? And then how did the research for this book and your artistic creations work together? Uh, I'm intrigued by the way, by the differences, I would say, between how visual artworks and written scholarly texts produce meaning. So I, I'm curious about your thoughts about that and how these two different processes intersect in your work. And then I wanted to know what's next for Filomena Cruz y Profesora Maite Subiarre. So that, those are my uh, comments and my thoughts today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for those incredibly uh, stimulating um, extensions and questions uh, for, for Maita. So um, I'll, I will assume that she'll gonna, she's going to pick those up in her talk in a few minutes. Um, for the moment, let me, uh, let me just immediately move to Professor Allison Karuth to invite her to um, contribute her comments now. Thank you. I think that my remarks will complement Professor Villasenor Black's. Um, I share with her a sense of this book's significance, both in relationship to new materialisms and as a border crossing project in so many senses, mm. facial, sociocultural, linguistic, aesthetic and um, disciplinary. So my own approach to this invitation to comment on Talking Trash, which I'm so grateful uh, to have um, been offered the opportunity, is in relationship to my own primary fields of the environmental humanities and science and technology studies. From my perspective, the project is a model for researchers situated in these kinds of transdisciplinary fields a model of looking to the arts, not just for cultural archives and objects of analysis, but also for collaborators and co-instigators. Professor Zubayari writes um, in the second or first chapter, in fact, I believe this, solid refuse accumulates in large scale open pits and sanitary landfills across the planet. It's ever growing monumentality, a source of permanent concern and fascination. But trash is not born big, it starts petite, and it is the unassuming smallness of garbage that will continue to occupy the pages that follow. Litterscapes leave their imprint in urban and natural surroundings. With this framework in mind, I found myself thinking often as I was reading Talking Trash about something that the environmental humanities scholar um, Stephanie Lemonager has termed new socialities, or has really kind of invited scholars, artists, activists, and other communities who work in collaboration with them um, to imagine and to build new socialities. She captures the spirit of this effort in a recent essay that outlines a disposition for the environmental humanities that, quote, speaks from disciplines rather than to them. She elaborates, fields like this have been tried out on the ground in college and university classrooms and in public spaces like museums and even beaches 
prior to their articulation as academic fields. There is and has been an everyday environmental humanities worked out in earnest and at times awkward collaboration among artists and scholars, reaching across the so-called two cultures from the humanities into the social and natural sciences as well. So I think Talking Trash really puts this into practice um, embodies this kind of effort to reach uh, far beyond disciplines and, and outside the academy. What I was particularly struck by was this focus on the small, the intimate, um, and the, the everyday in this uh, study of trash and in the range of um, artworks that, that Philomena Cruz uh, contributes to the book. At the outset of Talking Trash, Maita notes that her project is not primarily an environmental one, but rather a musing examination of the complex and muddled conflation of the artificial and the natural Donna Haraway style when it comes to all things discarded." End quote. So in this sense, it resonates with and I think speaks poignantly to work in the environmental humanities and environmental studies that has been focused increasingly on ever larger temporal and spatial scales of analysis above all on global warming, and I think the fruitfully contested framework of the Anthropocene. Through that lens, trash emerges predominantly in terms of what I'll call the gigantic afterlives of extractive consumer capitalism. And so I just wanted to offer some counterpoints to um, the works and practices and frameworks that uh, Talking Trash um, journeys through. And some of these um, come up indeed in the book itself. So the first is this sort of bird's eye or planet eye view of the global circuits of trash. And I think we can see this above all in how the so-called Pacific garbage patches have been visually rendered and represented. It's also, I think, on display in not only the photographic work of Edward Bertensky, but also this documentary that offers a kind of filmic journey through his large format photographs of enormous scale engineering and its various forms of global waste um, and waste handling. I'm going to just play the briefest clip from this because I think it speaks to this alternative and more dominant uh, narrative and imagination of trash that the book addresses um, and that Bertinsky himself describes as the industrial sublime. Several years ago, a reviewer looked at my work and reviewed a show of mine and referred to my work as embodying the industrial sublime. And I think that, for me, that's, uh, that wasn't a bad uh, description of what I do. I am interested in the elements of the sublime. Early in my career, I saw works of Caspar David Friedrich, a German romantic who um, cast his gaze from the pastoral landscape to nature itself, to the forces of nature. And uh, what I feel I'm doing in, uh, kind of 150 years later is casting my gaze at uh, our technology and the, um, uh, the things that we've constructed in pursuit of progress. So I think talking trash um, is really importantly skeptical of, um, resistant to this allure of the large scale um, and of the sublime uh, aesthetic or even affect that, that tends to get um, brought to the, the crisis or the challenge of, um, of trash uh, in the period of late modernity. At the same time that she acknowledges that the sort of um, same aesthetic and emotional habits of mind, of, of sublimity, of wonder, of enchantment, can still be um, uh, conjured and channeled when we look at smaller scales of trash. Um, and I think she's really self-reflective about those dynamics um, and kind of ethical quandaries throughout the book, and particularly in its conclusion. But this is another example of this planetary and gigantic scale view of trash as an infrastructural problem the Puente Hills landfill, which uh, was shuttered in 2013 and is now a proposed park site. Uh, the writers um, and scholars, uh, Jeff Manot and Nicola Twilley, in a photo essay published in 2013, I think speak to how, the, how trash tends to be represented in mainstream media, including environmental 
uh, media. They describe a landfill like Punta Hills as a mountain building exercise. And they use a really kind of stunning set of metaphors. They describe it as an astonishing and monumental act of landform construction. They relate it to, um, and here they're citing Edward Hume's garbology, they relate it in size and scale to the mass of 15 million de deceased elephants. They describe at length the kinds of machinery required to manage and sculpt this mountain building uh, infrastructure on a daily basis. And they also, though, zero in on something that Talking Trash wrestles with, which is that on the one hand, there is a kind of spectacular tradition. And I think um, Professor Villasenor Black's uh, remarks suggest this is quite, um, quite long standing of treating trash as spectacle and through sight and through vision, and that that can occlude this viscerality, this multisensory dimension. And so they, they in this piece, interestingly, spend a lot of time on, on smell and on the sort of textures of trash. And I think it is here where they start to be in conversation with um, some of Talking Trash's concerns uh, with a more intimate and embodied um, experience. I just wanted to now kind of pivot in my close in sort of closing here um, to how Talking Trash throughout its uh, sort of four case studies, if you will, works against the grain of this gigantic, spectacular uh, vision. Um, she spends some time in chapter one talking about the photographer Chris Jordan's photographs of e-waste, notes that in these um, images, trash appears as a kind of alien landscape. She notes, here that this is work that really speaks to the vast geological proportions of modern trash. I found this really striking that because it, this analysis of Jordan's work appears side by side with her extended discussion of the Barcelona-based artist, street artist, Francisco de Pajaro's um, garbage sculptors. And, and I was sort of thinking especially of this piece, Garbage Monster, which is a different kind of alien representation of trash, but one that directs our eyes to the street level, which is really crucial to um, this project. That in turn made me think about uh, this, um, the blockbuster film WALL-E uh, by Pixar Studios released in 2008. And on the one hand, this is a film that begins with that same kind of um, post-industrial sublime. We sort of descend on the earth from um, outer space to discover that in fact its topography is no longer natural, if you will, but entirely synthetic. It is a planet uh, comprised of mountains and indeed of skyscrapers of trash. And it presents that kind of um, post-industrial sublime as a new wilderness, I think. But on the other hand, through this very humanized, non-human protagonist, the robot trash compactor Wally, the film also works, I think, in a way that's in concert with talking trash. We go down to Wally's very small scale where he collects and repurposes all manner of objects from our century um, and they become cherished sort of talisman uh, to this, this futuristic character. So just to end then, I wanted to really um, emphasize that I think here is where Talking Trash is so powerful, both as a contribution to the multiple disciplines and fields at whose, at whose crossroads it's situated, and as itself um, a multimedia uh, work of social practice art. That, that this is a book that asks us to really move from that scale of the post-industrial sublime, that aesthetic sort of tradition, uh, to live literscapes, to, to really live not only um, their visceral and intimate qualities, but also their ethical and political histories and quandaries. In her chapter, Literscapes, she juxtaposes the monumentality of garbage, and indeed it's often cinematic and spectacular representations, with what she calls the garbage crumbs left behind by migrants, migrants and what has been termed border trash. And this leads her to an extended analysis of this collaboration between the photographer Richard Mizrak and the composer Guillermo Galindo, Border Cantos. She writes about this work, Galindo's only goal is to stay obsessively close to the object so as to fully breathe in the life of he or she who made it, his or her own. 
Conjure habits of salvaging, recycling, ordering, and otherwise repurposing trash that she observes here, I would say, um, for example, dumpster diver projects. The border cantos, and especially Galindo's cut instruments and compositions that are made out of these found artifacts at the US-Mexico border are, quote, physically and spiritually enmeshed with border crossers and discarded belongings. And it was here that I found a kind of provocation combined with her reflections and the conclusion about the other senses that we might want to bring to a study of and an engagement with trash at this scale. Um, and I would frame the provocation as a kind of question for our, our discussion. What kinds of art and social practices are needed to help fu fully apprehend what she terms the reality of obsolescence but also what I would call the visceral injustices of trash with this project very much in mind. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Professor Caruth. And I will now turn to Professor Zubiauri herself uh, for further comment. Thank you so very much. I'm gonna be sharing, I need to share my screen, right? Yes. Okay, um, thank you so much. Can you see it? We can. Everybody, everybody can. So I am uh, so very happy and moved and thankful for the incredibly incisive and brilliant comments from my dear colleagues and friends, uh, Professor Yasinor Black and Professor uh, Caruth. Uh, I do think that throughout my presentation, I will be responding from some of these questions, but I would like to respond to them, to them explicit, uh, very explicitly just now at the beginning. Uh, I'll start with uh, Charlene, who talked uh, first. So yes, indeed, a spatial turn is very important to my, to my academic work. My first book is actually on space in the realist novel, and that was exactly the intention. I was uh, very grateful that you mentioned this new material turn, which is actually, I think, happening not only in my work with but also in general in the humanities. Uh, in a way, it is, uh, the humanities is uh, the literature and language department type humanities is connecting much more with, with art and art history. And I do think my book is, is further proof uh, of that. I also very much appreciated that you mentioned uh, Doris Salcedo, who's an artist that I really uh, love, and as well as Linda Vallejo and uh, uh, particularly Rodrigo Gomez. And uh, you will see throughout my presentation that underdog style or rascuachismo permeates my work both as an artist and, and, uh, and, uh, and a writer. So I really appreciate that uh, uh, deeply. Uh, yes, this underdog style is precisely, and that responds a little bit to the question that, that Alison was posing at the very end. So what kind of art can actually respond to the question of trash and how trash is not only an environmental problem, but also a problem that signals social inequality. I do think that precisely rascuachismo is the way to address this. And that would, in my, in my view, be the, the best way to, to address the social issues and inequalities using the rascuachismo technique that I, uh, that actually we learned from first from from Mexican artists or Mexican ways of being real and ways of life, and then uh, adopted by by Chicana uh, life and and aesthetics. And uh, when uh, Charlene was asking me what are my sources of inspiration, I have to say that those are mostly Mexican art and Mexican art of the very popular kind. Uh, if I think, for example, of, about the world that gives. Uh, where I practice a niche in a, a, a boring gray wall. Uh, this was inspired by the niches that are pop, that populate Mexican streets and where Virgenes de Guadalupe and saints find uh, a home. Uh, Charlene is also, also asking me, what is the link between, between writing and creating? Well, it is a very close link uh, that helps me to divide into people. 
which enhances dialogue. And I think writing is mostly the result of dialogue. So uh, Filomena Cruz dialogues and fights and, and, and quarrels with Maite Zubiaurre. And out of that productive dialogue and quarrel, ideas uh, come to, the, to, to fruition. Maite Zubiaurre is quite conservative. Filomena Cruz, is, Filomena Cruz is not. So I think Filomena Cruz spices up, up Maite's quite, uh, uh, whatever, strict academic academic uh, 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 writing. And so my alter ego, Filomena Cruz, well, you know, I have many Filomenas at home and uh, that I acknowledge, I want to acknowledge my, my, my aunts and grandmothers who were all called Filomenas and they were very strong, independent women and misunderstood by the times. And Cruz came to me, I don't know why. I, I, it's really, I think it's, it's, it's a labor of the un unconscious and I just uh, like the, the way it sounds so that's that's the, the best I can I can actually uh, explain it but in any case I'm very very grateful for all these references and for really uh, Charlene I feel that you really understood my book and you really nailed it when you mentioned Rasquatismo because that is exactly what my book is about it's all about the underdog uh, so Thank you so very, very much. And uh, you mentioned a number of artists, actually, that I have to confess I don't know. So I would love to follow up with you and learn more about these other artists. I also love the, the desconchado uh, technique that goes back into colonial uh, times. I didn't know about that. I went as back as, uh, I don't know, I don't, the, the French term is now, I'm missing the French term. Trancassé, I think it's called, which is what happened with Gaudí and what happens with Watts Towers here. I didn't know that this sort of, of putting together pieces off happened also with, with uh, conchas, the conchados in, in, in colonial times. So I'm fascinated about that. You mentioned that my book has this historical dimension as well. And yes, I'm really very interested in tracing the origins of art made with trash back into history. So that gives me already a point of, of reference. Thank you so much uh, for that. And uh, Alison, again, uh, I think you really, really uh, mentioned something that has been, something that I've been struggling all throughout writing the book, which is what I like to call the uneasy dance between the gigantic and the very small. Uh, I make a semi-confession at the very end of the book. Throughout the book, I was trying to fight the big trash. I, I was trying to ignore it. I was trying to dismiss it. And I was trying to go for the more intimate, for the, more, for the small literascapes, for the small trash on the seat. Particularly because, as Charlene says, uh, mentioned, I'm very interested in the underdog. And this and litter is the underdog of gigantic trash who has gotten all the attention. But this said, uh, it is precisely what is, the reason I'm interested in small trash is because of the fear that it's gonna become gigantic. So that fear of the small turning into uh, acquiring gigantic proportions uh, lingers throughout all, uh, throughout all the pages of, of my book. And at the very end, I make a confession and I make two confessions in the conclusion. The first confession is, come on, this is not a book on trash because I wrote it from the distance and I didn't get my hands dirty. That's why I did the, Filomena Cruz did the joke of taking a picture of the hand of Maite Zubiaure and we were both actually sitting at the faculty center and Filomena Cruz said, put the hand up and took a picture of it. <laughs> so that's one confession. The other confession is uh, that I say, you know, you, I, can, you, I can talk small as much as I want. The truth is, uh, trash is taking over and it's a huge problem and it's a huge environmental uh, problem and that's why I mentioned the anecdote which is not an anecdote but but sheer fact of the London Fatberg which is this huge tumor that grew un underneath the city of London fed with uh, domestic uh, trash so yeah uh, also you talk about no so, new sociali uh, so, uh, socialities, something else that, that one needs to take uh, really into account how environmental studies is moving into, into different and more broader uh, directions. I, I need to learn about that much more. So again, if we could eventually have a conversation about that, I would really love it. Uh, you mentioned Puente Hills. Puente Hills has been very important in my academic life. I've, I've visited, with, I took students there actually, 
and before it closed down. And again, I call it an uneasy, difficult dance because it's from the intimate and the small to the big. But then I did the other, I did it the other way around. I visited the water reclamation plant in Puente Hills that is still open, by the way. And I took pictures of, of pictures of fecal waters. And with this fecal waters, I printed uh, textiles and I made a cushion made out of uh, fecal waters. So I brought the fecal waters back home. I brought the immensity of these dirty waters that we produce back home. So again, it's, it's, I think the reality or the, or the truth lies in this moving back and forth from the small to the big, from the gigantic to the minuscule. So yeah, I think I have more or less, I think, addressed uh, your questions and I hope my presentation now will further uh, contribute to doing that. And if not, we do have a, a, a hopefully time left for questions and, and answers. So let me begin by saying that I would love to thank everybody that made uh, this possible. Uh, first of all, of course, Professor Lori Hart, who is the director of the Center for European and Russian Studies and who persistently invited me to host uh, this event first in presence and now remotely. Uh, my thanks go out also to Liana Grancia and to Sanja Lacan, who have made uh, this possible. And of course, needless to say, to uh, my wonderful uh, friends, colleagues, and uh, brilliant uh, discussions, as you have been able to witness of Talking Trash, my book. Uh, last but not least, I would like to dedicate uh, this presentation to my students, because without their incisive comments and, and passionate discussions, uh, this book would have never existed. And let me also thank you, my dear friend who passed away not too long ago, Professor Ricardo Quinones, from the Clare, uh, professor at, at the Claremont Colleges, whom I owe the name of the book. Uh, we talked, uh, we had many spirited conversations about trash, and he suggested that the book be called Talking Trash, and I honor uh, his memory, uh, would like to dedicate this, this presentation also to him. Uh, okay, so, okay, sorry about this. Okay, so in a nutshell, a cultural use of waste is, as uh, Alison put uh, so eloquently, in small trash and looks at little through the eyes of international artists. It reflects upon the anthropomorphic natu nature of urban ref refuse, the poetics and semantics of micro literscapes and the archives of all things discarded, dumpsterology, and here I move from content to continent, or the history of the garbage container as a gendered artifact, dense with cultural meaning. In fact, gender is permeates. Uh, all uh, my my book and my research in general uh, on dirty innocence or the complex and contradictory link that ties childhood to muck and last but not least uh, to the so-called desert trash sometimes also xenophobically called migrant tra trash or the personal belongings left behind by migrants at the UC, uh, US uh, Mexico border so Again, uh, my, uh, sorry about this, did I go the, the right way? Let me check something. Sorry about this, I think there's something missing here. Okay, uh, so in a nutshell, uh, okay, I said that. Okay, so my book is based on a, on a very basic uh, principle, uh, which is, uh, the need to slow down and look at uh, trash uh, for there is my there's my 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 unshakable belief there's a narrative in trash in litter and certainly in each cigarette butt and narratives trigger empathy. Uh, I call this the beauty of the myopic gaze, which by the way is the gaze in general of the humanities. So I would like you also, I, I'm, I'm sorry about this. Let me just do one thing. I'm missing, sorry about this interruption, but I do, I'm missing one. I don't know what happened, but I am missing one slide. Okay, it doesn't matter. 
Anyhow, uh, what I was about to say in that slide is what I already said, so it, it's not important, is that the, this book is written uh, with four hands, the hands of Maite Zubiaurre, who is in charge of academic writing, and the hands of Filomena Cruz, who takes pictures, does collages, and infuses uh, poetic twists into the academic uh, uh, text. So again, so it is a book fundamentally on litter, small trash, it is written with four hands and it really insists on slowing down and looking at trash to find the narratives that are embedded in it. And narratives trigger empathy. Empathy and emotion is also a very important uh, concept in, in my book and in all my uh, uh, thing, uh, thought about all things uh, trash. So I would like you uh, to invite you to my, uh, what I like to call my trash journey. And a journey that, if I think about it, began well before talking trash, precisely because what Charlene was mentioning, because my, uh, my devotion for the underdog and the underdog style. So for example, when I wrote El Espacio en la Novela Realista, the space in the, in the uh, realist novel, uh, space was ancillary to time and therefore somewhat disposable as narratology wanted it uh, at that time. Uh, when uh, Professor Roberto Johnson and myself put together this an anthology of uh, feminist Spanish uh, thought, women thinkers were and still are, alas, ancillary to male philosophers. When I wrote Cultures of the Erotic in Spain, that then I translated into Spanish, Culturas del Erotismo, uh, of course the body, and most of it the erotic body, was ancillary to the mind and popular culture, repressed by Francoist dictatorship, ancillary to high culture. Talking crush, I couldn't go farther down, no need to explain. And then uh, our last book, uh, actually co-authored with Professor Kaff, Lucaito Sideris, Kressner, and Chrisman, uh, we look at the city through the lens of the humanities, which is uh, ancillary to the social sciences when it comes to study cities. So in any case, uh, talking trash is only one piece uh, uh, within a much larger, larger endeavor or itinerary that includes teaching, trash art and two artistic interventions by Filomena Cruz, a collaborative interdisciplinary project that includes a scholarly monograph, a digital map and a documentary, my translation of talking trash into Spanish that I sent it uh, two weeks ago, uh, roughly two weeks ago to the, to the publisher in Spain, and yet another short uh, documentary. So let me start with teaching. Uh, in 2015, I talked an honors course called Society of Excess on Waste, Consumer Culture, and the Environment. And I taught it with the, uh, with the, with the objective of teaching empathy through trash awareness to my students and to have them listen to the narratives of trash and all creatures uh, discarded. The, the seminar ended bombastically with a huge artistic intervention on UCLA campus that included a trash show, a trash monster, as you see on the, on the screen made by one of my students, and a, a, a boisterous trash parade. I want to emphasize that this is a collaborative project and, and a patchwork of ideas coming all from the students. My only goal or my only role that I played here is putting everything together and make it as noisy, uh, excessive and, and uh, uh, over the top as possible. And I think we uh, succeeded uh, greatly in, in that. So students decided to wear trash. They also decided to uh, lie down on the floor in solidarity uh, with trash and ended up uh, tracing silhouettes with trash facts to raise awareness. Uh, there's a video about this, uh, UCLA Magazine got interested and it's actually quite fun to, to watch. So again, so wearing garbage and lying on the floor among litter raises awareness and triggers empathy. I'm convinced about that and I was able actually to convince my students. I taught this course again in a, another honors course and also at, at the graduate uh, seminar level. But what about, and this is something that Filomena uh, is trying to do all the time, elevating trash via art. And by art, by trash, I mean, again, as you see in the images, small pieces of trash, litter. So the main source of inspiration for, for me or of uh, Filomena Cruz uh, is small litter and also trash containers. So I simply take photographs of, of 
trash or trash containers, cut them, make trash collages, and often serialize them and the Warhol style, because for Filomena Cruz, uh, if, if uh, Warhol saw excess and consumption, wanted to portray that, Filomena Cruz says exactly the same thing, the same degree of excess, if not more, and of repetition in ejection. And that's exactly her, 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 uh, in, uh, her objective, reflect or re re depict excess and repetition in trash. That's therefore she, was, uh, she uh, copies or steals actually from, from Warhol's uh, work. So serving trash on a platter, again, uh, uh, elevating the underdog, that's one of my main issues. And uh, for that, I just use very simple ingredients. Well, the only thing I need is a phone camera, a color printer, a scanner, a pair of scissors, a glue stick, acrylic paints, varnish, thrift store frames, boxes, and platters. And tell, let me tell you, I miss my thrift stores dearly now that I cannot access I have access to them. Fortunately, I'm a hoarder, so I have many still available in my uh, garage. So uh, the trash cape that you see, the Venice uh, beach on a platter, that's the first platter that I did. And then later came Flora in Mortales uh, in 2017. Uh, but more importantly, uh, what I use mostly is an expensive four by four tiles so that I can paste collages on them and give them away for, for free. I am a big advocate of art that is that you can give away from, uh, from free. Uh, uh, that's the art I think that can revolutionize uh, the huma uh, uh, humankind, not the, the one that you have uh, to buy. And then now with the coronavirus crisis, actually, uh, interesting things are happening to art when museums open up their galleries and open up their collections, etc. Anyhow, that's a, a different discussion to be, to be had. So I also uh, constantly recycle my trash collages. That's why I call my art practice endless recycling. I print them, I recut them, and make more coll collages of previous ones. This is an example. I had this Venice trash cape. I, I have many from 2018. And then I did a new trash cape, actually, that is called the specter of coronavirus, the presence in the, the fear in black and white that the coronavirus will return. So again, this is how I work. And I'm, I'm happy that Charlene mentioned the, the bottle cups, Gomez Peñas' bottle cups, because those are always, have always fascinated me. And this is just a very, very pragmatic example uh, of how I work when I do these collages. So Filomena Cruz found a bottle cup and she rotated it. Then she found a suit on a dumpster, opened the jacket, pictured the inner lining and just rotated it. And the rotated uh, bottle cup became the body of this alien, of this Marsling, I like, as, I like him to, to, as I like to call him, whereas the inner lining became, or the, the inner pocket became the trunk of a palm tree. Uh, so since then, since, since the, this alien was born, it has been with me in my art, uh, from its inception. Uh, I call this particular collage Amor Imposible, uh, Impossible Love, because the alien is in love with a mannequin, and this mannequin actually lives in a thrift store. I go a lot to lift, thrift stores not only because they provide me with so much material, because uh, they let you photograph freely, which they don't do, let you do in other uh, stores. So again, one marsling, many stories, and through endless trash watching, rotating, recycling, and recollaging, narratives and empathy are copiously born. That's, in a nutshell, my philosophy, or if I were to write an artist statement, which I haven't done, it would say something in those lines. So this is actually one of my artistic interventions. Uh, it's based on a series, on one of my uh, series. It's called The Immortals. What I do is I go to the beach, pick up trash, and add googly eyes to them. Basically, I add anthropomorphic features to discarded objects, to humanize them, and to make it possible for them to trigger empathy. So in 2017, my uh, dear friend and colleague, Ananya Roy, invited me through the Institute of Inequality to participate and also to rave a group protesting Trumpism of which I was part of, invited me then to uh, be part of this collection, collective action called Teach, Organize, Resists. And what I did is I uh, made 
200 collages with uh, these creatures and uh, basically peppered the UCLA campus with them to raise awareness about ocean pollution. And the next day, sure enough, all these creatures had uh, left. So uh, I added a new version of it because these creatures are uh, aware of, of contemporary issues and I made immortals in coronavirus time helping to raise awareness. Of course, they don't need any masks because plastic, as we know, is quasi immortal. So this is actually what I consider my most important uh, and long-standing uh, intervention. It's called The Wall That Gives El Muro Queda. And I do need to give some background to understand this. So when we moved to our uh, home in uh, Venice in 2010, the, the home was, is, was and is separated from Pacific Avenue by a long wall. The wall was adorned with a beautiful mural by Jules Mack that basically honored the locals, the Venice locals, and uh, painted their portraits on the wall. So two days after we moved in, or two years, sorry, after we moved in, somebody at night had covered the faces and defaced them with swastikas. So after that hate crime, the wall was a boring gray wall for a long time, till I looked at it one day and I said, when the, the, the discourses about hate and, and building walls and, and anti-migrant discourse become, uh, started proliferating even pre-Trump times, I decided to do exactly, to switch the, the discourse and do exactly the opposite, to do a friendly wall that would actually be hospitable and give and be generous and not hostile and separate people. So uh, I built this niche that again, I, as, as I was mentioning before, it, it's an inspiration that comes from Mexican art. I built this niche for a seven by four niche in that big wall. And every day since then, I leave a tile free to be taken. Uh, the one that you see on the on the screen is the one that I just put up this morning. Uh, probably it's not there anymore. It, it, it is a somber uh, homage to uh, what is happening to us in the coronavirus time and it's called Six Feet uh, Apart. And as you see, my alien shows up uh, again. So uh, the my wall as all walls actually that are allowed to live is furiously active and has gone through many uh, iterations. I first started very simple, very rudimentary. I just wrote chalk uh, with chalk on the walls, but then uh, uh, as you see, it has moved, uh, it has changed all the time. And now you have different versions of the wall that gives El Muro uh, Queda, who is constant, constantly graffitied, which I actually applaud. So, and then in some ways, the wall that gives El Muro Queda comes to full circle because the mural that was defaced in 2010 by Jules Mack was then restored by Jules Mack in 2018 in a different fashion. Uh, she actually arrived at that wall. My, my husband called me and said, there's a woman here with a group of young men who is, wants to paint your wall. And I talked to her on the phone and she said, I'm Jules Mack. And I was so happy. So, oh my goodness, I really wanted to meet you. So I rushed home from, from UCLA. And the only requisite that I sort of uh, quote unquote imposed on her is it has to say the wall that gives El Muro Queda. And there that she did playfully so and added this cup, this couple of frolicking rabbits and pot smoking rabbits that to the delight of my two teenage sons and uh, to my delight uh, as well. Uh, uh, one, uh, the, this, there's, a, there's a short video and an article about this as well. I added the, the link if you're interested. It's also interesting to watch. So, but happily, uh, and, and, but it, this didn't last long. So the wall once again was defaced, in this case, sort of playfully defaced. Uh, and graffiti happens actually uh, all the time. Uh, and I really embrace Banksy's uh, uh, ingenious uh, quote. People say graffiti is ugly, irresponsible, and childish, but that's only if it's done properly. And it is certainly done properly all the time on my wall. So these are the tiles, examples of tiles that I leave every day. I also do little sculptures occasionally, and then I take pictures of them, and then they are transformed into tiles again. And you, uh, this is, as, as I mentioned, it's just art for free. Uh, you will probably ask why is there a star line a double decker tourist bus bus in in the image and i will tell you why because it's a funny anecdote so there's this double decker 
bus always drives along uh, Pacific Avenue uh, filled with tourists. And then my family and myself realized that it often stopped in front of the wall and a guy just ran out and picked a tile and ran back in. Well, that, that happened dozens of times. I, one day I was able to catch <laughs> the guy and I asked and I told him oh I'm the artist I'm the one who does the tiles uh, have they become yet another Venice tourist attraction he said yes that too but mostly I'm using them to retiling my restroom my bathroom so who would have thought that somebody is retiling and elevating trash uh, uh, Venice is retiling his, his his bathroom actually with Venice trash uh, so, and the world gives, but community gives back as well. So these are just some examples of what uh, community is all anonymous. I don't survey it. It's again, it's strictly and, and purposely anti-surveillance. So I don't know who does this. I do know though that one of my dear friends and colleagues who also lives in Venice, uh, Christina Palm Palmer, left that orange that says uh, Echo in Venice made in Venice. That's one of my favorite ones. And these are the ones that I also love, uh, very much Venice, in the spirit of Venice, marijuana, dreams, and vitamin C in the form of a kiwi. Uh, so one day, actually, uh, I got this moving email, and I'm going to read it because it really captures the spirit of the world. So out of the blue, I got this, uh, Philomena Cruz has a Gmail, and she received this a particular message. He says, hi there, this is out of the blue, but I wanted to tell you, uh, I want to tell you and thank you for something. You don't know me and I don't know you, but one day I was walking home down the street and wasn't having the best of days and came upon a hole in the wall. I saw your piece uh, of fine art that captures my attention and it was the one that had trash cans on the beach with many colors in it on the tile piece. I picked it out from the hole and thought, what is this? Little did I know that as my mind, my mind wandered into the art piece that I found uh, into the art piece that I found myself no longer bothered by my bad day. Your art had taken my mind off something negative and turned into into a positive. How could trash cans be so awesomely artsy and cool? I felt a bit hesitant to take it home with me, but I did. In return, I left five dollars on the screen. You see it under a rock in the hole, and hopefully, someone walking by in need would find it. Again, thank you. Keep up the beautiful work you do. It makes a difference. So I say it captures the spirit of the world because he understood, Kyle understood that he was not paying me back, but he was leaving some money there for somebody in need, which is exactly what the world attempts at, attempts at, at doing. So the world is talkative. Uh, when I started the, pro the, the project, I saw that graffiti diminished a little bit and artists started doing something else, which, which was basically using the imperfections and cracks on the wall to do their own art. One day somebody painted actually a clown uh, close to the niche and I I engaged in the dialogue. I accepted the invitation to dialogue. I had taking a picture of the clown, making a collage with it and leaving the collage in the niche and it was gone very soon. So uh, the world that gives, as I was saying, a response to contemporary time. It has a sense of history and what is happening today. And uh, it only, it talks within itself. It dialogues with what is on painted on it, but it also dialogues with its surroundings. So I wanted to highlight this guy this uh, who's smoking a joint and uh, an artist whom I don't know puts, his, puts, puts, puts this image all over, pastes this image all over Venice. But sure enough, in the last weeks, it shows up again at a dumpster actually, which is adjacent to my wall and he is keeps smoking the joint, but has a mask on it. And the same dumpster actually shows a picture of Trump uh, drinking uh, bleach. As you say, uh, both the wall and the dumpsters in my home are very politically conscious, conscious and engaged with reality, political and health-wise. So this is how the world that gives looks uh, right now. I al always give the wall in quotation marks to muralists and uh, it changes face all the time. In this case, uh, high schoolers from Samo High School asked me if they could do a mural. I said, yes. It was cut short, short because of uh, coronavirus and it has the naive style of school projects granted. But what is interesting is that these naive, idealistic words, love and trust and joy were soon uh, uh, accompanied by 
a very sobering no sleep during the coronavirus. So, so again, coronavirus is leaving its imprint uh, in my wall. And also the type of, of presence the wall is giving are different. This is, I call the lockdown treasures. We all know how valuable a number of weeks ago, toilet paper and hand sanitizers uh, were. And so the wall gave that to me or to us. And later on, two weeks later, I got this beautiful candle and a mask and a thank you note. Anyhow, I'm gonna be finishing in a minute. Uh, so Filomena uh, Cruz is not talking anymore. This is Maite Tubiaure again. I was telling you that my book will be uh, published in Spanish as well. Uh, and uh, what I'm doing in that book, though I'm translating it, I'm also rewriting it unavoidably, and I am devoting more pages to a so-called border trash, to which Alison also referred to. And on top of that, I am en I'm, I'm engaging or I'm engaged already in a, a multi or three pronged a collaborative interdisciplinary project that is called Forensic Empathy, Archiving and Mapping Death in the Borderlands. A, in, a, in a nutshell, this project studies how emotion in its multiple gradations played, plays out at the borderlands. It looks at archives, artistic representations and virtual maps as powerful empathy machines. So the garments and personal belongings left behind by migrants along the US-Mexico border are the crux of this three-prong collaborative endeavor that includes a scholarly monograph, a documentary, and a digital map. I want to acknowledge the huge influence of uh, uh, Jason de Leon's very important and crucial book, uh, The Land of Open Graves, in this project. And also, I wanted to mention that this documentary that we're putting together, we're doing in collaboration with a wonderful group of Tijuana artists and, and filmmakers called, a, a, a collective called a, a Dignicraft. Well, a, last but not least, a, I'm collaborating with Christine, Christy Guevara Flanagan, my colleague and friend from the cinema school. And we are directing and uh, producing and uh, writing a, a a, a, a short documentary, barely 14 minutes long, that started a, with one of these artifacts left behind by the, by the migrants, in this case, water bottles. And it's devoted to, in homage to Aguilas del Desierto, a group of volunteers living in migrants of humble means that live in San Diego and travel once, uh, once a month to Arizona to retrieve the remains of the migrants who die in the desert of Arizona and in, in, the, in the hope of bringing some peace uh, to the families. So in a nutshell, that's what Maite Zubiaure in dialogue with Filomena Cruz is doing. Thank you so very much. Uh, I think uh, hopefully we have some time for, for, for entertaining questions and answers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Zubiaure. And now we will turn to uh, a few questions. I'll withhold any commentary until the very end. Unfortunately, we don't have much time, so I'm gonna summarize a few of them. Um, the first question has to do with, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Susan Peirce's work on collecting and the continuum of trash, objects in use and art, particularly in collections and in museums. Um, and the question is, how you see this much older pattern changing in the specific historical context of extractive petrocapitalism, plastics in particular, and our disposable culture. Uh, could you repeat? I, I didn't understand the first part of the, of the reflection of this. Uh, the first part of the reflection has to do with a reflection on Susan Peirce's work, Pierce Peirce, I'm okay. not exactly sure how it's pronounced, uh, on collecting and the continuum of trash uh, and objects in use and art. And, but what the, the gist of the question really has to do with how you see older patterns changing in reference to the historical context of extractive federal capitalism. Okay, if, if I understand the question well, uh, this is a question that has uh, uh, worried me quite a bit. What is it, uh, particularly, uh, I hope I'm responding to, uh, the que uh, to the question, particularly in the context of migrant artifacts. The question that is very important to take into account is 
who has the right to these objects? And now when I was, uh, I've been going to the desert when doing a number of field trips, that question is very much uh, present. So do museum, uh, museums have the, the right to collect those objects and keep them in, 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 in collections? Do private collectors have the right to them? Do anthropologists have the right to work and tinker with them? Do local artists have the right to do that? So what do we do with all these objects considered uh, trash? And uh, what are the ways, and that goes back to Alison's questions, uh, what, what can we do actually with these objects that raises awareness and doesn't further feed into artistic capitalism? Thank you so much. All right, let me move on to um, a second question. Um, and that question is, um, uh, one day uh, trash is, uh, this has to do with the dynamism of trash. One day it's ancillary trash cast away, but the next day it might be reclaimed and recycled. We might think of the fecal waters that you brought home or the immortals you make out of beach trash and so on. Um, in other words, the moment that we pick it up or notice or empathize with trash, does it cease to be trash? So this is the ultimate question. What yes. is trash really? <laughs> yes, it ceases to be trash <laughs> because it is wanted again. Uh, trash is that what you don't want. And uh, this is a deep philosophical question where what does want and unwanting end and start, right? But the moment you pick something up, you elevate it from the floor. That thing is alive again with desire. It is wanted, it's not trash anymore. Thank you. Um, here's a question dear to my heart because it's from a, a student in anthropology, one of our graduate students. Um, and the question is, I wonder if you could please elaborate a little bit on how you see your work in dialogue with anthropology since it's clear that the book intersects strongly with the work of anthropologists? Well, again, time for a confession. I really wanted to study anthropology. <laughs> and I did not because the Spanish university was enmeshed in a political upheaval. And at that time, I was a obedient slash stupid girl. And I listened to my mom and I didn't go to anthropology. <laughs> so this is my way of going back to anthropology. I see, I, I see it as very closely related to anthropology and certainly to archeology. span uh, uh, Trash, this trash is archeology span or retrieving trash is the archeology span of the, of the contemporary. And looking for the anthropomorphic traits in objects is also closely related to anthro anthropology. The type of work I do, which again, I am not an anthropologist. I would never call myself one because I'm not, but I am amateurishly anthropologic, uh, amateurish anthropologist. The way I canvas trash and look for it and the notes I take do mimic or, or mirror anthropological work. Thank you. Okay. Here is a question um, concerning the, uh, the, the points about seriality that you make. Does seriality in, attempt, in attempting to represent excess also in some ways rehearse the excess at the core of many discussions about trash, but also perhaps mark this artistic excess with minimal interventions, different graduations in color, for example, in the trash cans you showed, and visible differences, showing these representations of trash as something different than the landscape visions of trash that are perhaps more, more common. So the question is to talk a little bit more about the effects of seriality in trash in your work. Yeah, that's actually very well observed. Thank you for that very good question. Uh, yes, I do. I do serial work, but as the as the, the, the colleague who asked the question uh, uh, very very well noticed, there are always little variations, and those little variations are there to to rob trash from its anonymity and therefore non-existence. It's another way of humanizing it. So yes, uh, it's a way actually of, of making trash wanted again. The moment we see difference, we want desire uh, is reborn. Thank you so much. We are out of time for questions. So 
I just want to um, make one final comment, and that is that um, I think one of the themes that the speakers have brought forward here is both the uh, celebratory aspects of the work that you, Maita, and Philomena do together, but also the, the, the sort of um, uh, serious matter of the endangerment, the serious matter of uh, what Professor Carruth called the visceral injustices of tra trash. And I think that's actually the terrain that is so interesting that all of you have spoken to. It's a very, um, it's a very labile terrain. It's not, it's not a settled terrain, but I think you've all elicited the, the sort of uh, painful edge of, of that confrontation. So I really want to thank the excellent speakers, uh, Villa Senor, uh, Professor Villa Senor Black, Professor Carruth, and of course, Professor Zubiaure for such a stimulating presentation. And I also thank our wonderful audience for the extraordinary questions and um, our staff for, um, for helping us to um, so uh, smoothly present this uh, seminar. So thank you so much, um, everyone. And please join us again for further talks. And you can follow up uh, with the book on uh, Professor Zubiare's websites and also those of our speakers. So thank you to everyone. And mm -hmm. thank you so very much Ruth, to everybody. Very thank honored. You. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.